really disappointing. It's as simple as that. We uh, we did enough things right in the first half that we had a little bit of a lead, but I think it just came down to a little bit more want in the third quarter. They just wanted the win. And the dogs have done enough. They were sensational in the second half. We should never have let that game go the way it went. Fort Adelaide challenged in the last quarter, but couldn't quite complete the contract. We're that club that's in that renewal stage, and we need to make sure every chance we play, we get something out of the game. Certainly tonight, and we got a big lesson. Port Adelaide with a fairy tale story for the first five weeks, undefeated under new coach Ken Hinckley, but they've fallen in a bit of a hole at half time up in Darwin. They led uh, quite well and yet uh, have managed to lose that one, and uh, that makes it five in a row, which is not great timing for you, Ken, but welcome anyway. No, it's not, Jared, but yeah, thanks for having me along. Half time, I uh, was watching the game till half time, turned it off uh, and turned it over to another match. Thought you were home and hosed. I uh, was surprised that you uh, got run over. Yeah, look, we'd had a really solid first half of the game where we'd uh, had the game on our terms quite a bit, and uh, we felt as if if we could continue that, we'd probably win the game of football. But credit where credit's due, the, the Bulldogs boys come out uh, really hard after half time, and uh, you know they won the contested ball clearly in that quarter, and they just got the result that they needed on the scoreboard. We win three quarters, we lose the game, but we got what we deserved. Ken, 10 scores to three just before half time. Did you see anything that was appearing in front of you that made you think that your grip on the game was slipping? I mean, you led 5 5 to three goals. That's a big break in a low scoring game. Yeah, no, not really. I mean, that last 30 seconds when Minson kicked mm. the goal off the ground from, you know, out, out from about 20, 25 metres out, you just felt then a little bit of, gee, we've done a lot of good work here, but the margin's only 11. So you thought, like, you know, we've left them in the game a little bit with more of a chance, a bit more, I suppose, hope in them. Can I ask you about Darwin playing up there? Aesthetically, it's not pretty. I mean, I know why we do it. It's promotional value, money for footy clubs, etc. But is it the right place to play a game of football in the middle of the year, in the middle of the footy season? Oh, look, it's incredibly difficult to play. I mean, you watch that game and you thought the first quarter, everything was going OK, and then the game almost changed before your eyes and it become incredibly difficult to play. It is a good environment to take football as far as for, for fans and, and for everyone to go there, but I suppose it's a really difficult game to play when some of the other games are not played. And we didn't have no rain, no nothing, but it looked like it was a, like it was a game that Amy was that day when it was wet and slippery mm. and rain. We, we just dealt with the same conditions, but more from the heat. Is that, uh, I guess, the comparison, Mike? I mean, there was a game in Amy that was played in worse conditions. Yeah, but I was talking to Bobby Murphy before, and Ken, you have the same view as it, that there are unique conditions up there. It goes from perfect to when this sort of humidity and the dew comes in, and it's impossible to handle the footy. Yeah, it's exactly right. I mean, first quarter we've kicked 3-3 and two goals, and it was a quite a good scoring quarter for us. But then, uh, you know, as I said, the game changed before your eyes, and it was almost in really difficult to get a score and, uh, you know, with any certainty that you are going to be able to convert. No, I'm going to go with the glass half full, Kenny. I mean, you're five and five. Obviously, the, the downside is you win your first, you lose your, your next. But I'm, I'm sure going into the season, you would have taken five and five. I mean, you've, you've improved significantly. I guess one of the challenges as a, as a team that needs to make a statement, you, you've been up for a long time. I mean, you have to do well in the, the NAB Cup. You know, you have to present a good product then. You've got a youngish team. It just seems to me that you're looking really tired, you know, in, in round 10. Yeah, I said, we don't want to use that as, as any excuse, but you're right. I mean, at the start of the year, we, we'd be really honest. Just say five and five would have been, you know, we'd have been probably happy enough to, to take that result. But we, uh, you know, we got away to that good start and we've let some games slip. I suppose the pleasing part for us, and we've said all year that we'll keep back games. Every game that we've lost, we've won the last quarter. You know, that certainly says that our boys are staying at the task a bit. But, you know, again, we just would have liked to have had one more, two more wins, and we've been in a couple of those games where we perhaps could have got there. Here's your numbers uh, from rounds one to five and six to ten. Now, we can put up the numbers, but you're in a position to tell us why is it so? Yeah, no, look, there's no doubt that some of the, the numbers we've, you know, we, we have got a little bit tired, I suppose, as far as a group goes, and we have been up for a long time, as Rusey said. But, you know, I think more importantly, after five zip, the competition started to look at us a little bit closer yeah. too, mm -hmm. you know, and they put a bit more pressure on us. Going into the start of the season, we'd also beaten West Coast and Sydney, you know, going into their first games mm. of the season. So they were at full strength, so we'd, we'd gained a bit of confidence, you know, and the competition have said, oh, OK, we've, we've got under the radar a little, but I think then after that they've gone, hang on, we've, we're going to stop and have a look at it. We, look, we're really strong that we've got to get going again, and, and the buys probably has come at a good time for us. It's just a matter of now getting back up and going again. Well, so with the microscope you... on, they've clearly isolated Hamish Hartlett as somebody that needs to be locked down on. His numbers have uh, dropped right off. 
Uh, he's going to have to learn to live with a tag. There are his numbers, 0 to 0, uh, rounds 1 to 5 and 6 to 10. Champion data ranking points will tell you in the first half he was almost all Australian level. The second half he's uh, right back down. and You, can't, you haven't got enough A-grade players to have you, one of your better players not getting it. No, no, Hamish needs to stand up. He's a leader of our club and uh, you know, we expect him to stand up. His last two weeks he has got going a little bit again. You know, and we're really pleased that he's been able to do that, but he's got to learn to deal with the tag. He's got to be, uh, you know, he's going to be a, an elite midfielder in this competition. That's tough work and you've just got to be able to handle it and you've got to improve every day you go to work. How, how do you get up after the bye? I mean, what do you, what do you look at? Because clearly you do need to, to re-evaluate. Re but is it a case to rest? I mean, I know the bye can be really tricky. You, you, you don't play. When do you train? You know, how long do you train? All that. Sort of stuff. So a lot of, uh, there's a lot of planning that goes into these next two weeks. Yeah, yeah, look, a lot of sides don't come off the bye that well either. I mean, we look at that and history will tell us that a little bit. But I think for us, we'll kind of come back to training on Sunday. So we're going to have a full week of training going into the, uh, you know, the next week's game on the Sunday. So we'll come back with the boys on Sunday, get them back into uh, work. And uh, you know, we have to give them a break day. You just have to give them a freshen up. I mean, so they're off till Sunday? No, nah, they'll go off tomorrow and they'll tomorrow. have three or four days away. But, yep. you know, when you look at us and you, you look at us at being the third youngest team in the competition by the numbers, we probably do need to give them a rest. You know, and then hopefully recharge them a little. And, you know, we've got some challenges. We've got GWS, and then we go into a, a bracket of three or four really good sides in the competition, which we look forward to. You're a veteran assistant coach. You're a long time getting your chance at senior level. What's the biggest surprise to you now that you're calling the shots? Oh, no, there's not too much, Mike, to be honest. I mean, I've been around for a long time, as you said. I've enjoyed it. I suppose the surprise to me is that I haven't got tired at all in the job, and I, you know, I'm fresh in the job, and I uh, love every minute of that. But I suppose there's a little bit more work you have to do away from football with, uh, you know, in Adelaide especially, we've got a lot of media and we've got the paper and the radios and we're always something on the telly about uh, Port Adelaide or Adelaide. And, uh, you know, there's a fair bit of that that goes on. But I just love turning up to work each day and, uh, you know, enjoy work with a young group of players. You've got a high-profile president who's uh, been great for your club, but has he, has he fallen for the trap of uh, looking at reviews of players and sending you through uh, things that perhaps you <laughs> might have missed out on? <laughs> No, no, of course he hasn't done anything. He's been great for our club. I mean, you look, you've got Reno on our shirts and, yep. that, and, and he's brought a lot of that positivity. He's made Port Adelaide relevant again in the competition. Have you got credibility back with your own people? You lost the AFL. was really concerned about mm. that 12 months ago. Oh, look, I think our numbers suggest that we've got over 40,000 members and uh, our people, our Port Adelaide people have jumped on big for us and uh, we need them to stay. And, you know, I think they understand where we're at and where, what we're going through and we need to continue to show those signs that we are... in going forward with our footy club. How do, you put the Port, sorry, Ruth, yeah. how do you put the Port Adelaide stamp on the Adelaide Oval? I mean, the, the way you're playing at at the present time has always been viewed by your uh, support base as Adelaide's ground, but you've got an opportunity to make Adelaide Oval Port Adelaide's ground. Yeah, we have, and it's a great spot. It's going to be a great location. I mean, having come out of Melbourne and where, you know, where Eddie Hat is and that, you just know that having the Oval so close to the city, it's going to just attract so many more people. It's going to be really exciting mm. for our football club. We've got to go there and, and make a mark right at the start and say this is, this is our home ground and we're going to own this place. You've been at three distinctly different clubs, which is quite... I mean, you're really well-placed to, to give us an idea of the landscape. I mean, obviously Geelong, um, then going to the Suns as, a, as a, a new franchise and then going across to to port that were seen as, you know, a, a trouble club, as Mike said before. I mean, what do you see as the keys to, to, to building a, a really successful footy club? Uh, I think there's, there's absolutely one, and it's about stability. You know, it's one that's really important. Having come out of Geelong and you see Brian Cook, Frank Costa and, and Mark Thompson, they just stuck through and got the job done really well. And you go into, uh, certainly up at the Franchise Club at the Gold Coast, and you see that that's one of the key things that I know with Travis Ald and, and Bluey and, and even Malcolm Blight, they've been big on keeping stability at the football club. That's the thing that I've taken into Port Adelaide and spoken with Keith and, uh, and David about, is that we need to be a really stable club. We need to have certainly direction that we're heading in, but we've got to stick the course. And you know, that's really important, I think, for any football club. It's really dangerous to, uh, to jump from one to the other, and you, you probably end up going nowhere. Ken, Rizzi mentioned your time at Geelong. You played seven years with Gary Ablett Senior, and you coached Gary Ablett Junior at Geelong and Gold Coast in an assistant role for about seven or eight years. Who's going to leave the bigger legacy? Uh, two enormously talented players. Obviously, that's the obvious. Gary's, uh, Gary Senior, as a player, probably you know, led Geelong on the field. Gary Junior, probably for mine, if he can do what he's been able to do at Geelong at the Gold Coast, I think there's probably little doubt that he'll leave a bigger legacy on the game. Well, probably little doubt. Do you think little Gary's a better player at the Gold Coast than he was at Geelong? Uh, he's an incredible player at both places. Yeah. He was, uh, you know, I seen... More rounded? I, yeah, probably a little more rounded. I've seen his game at 2008 Grand Final at Geelong where we got beat. And, uh, you know, Gary 
probably led the way in, in that game himself. And then I've seen him do some incredible things at the Gold Coast, where he's just willed himself to the next contest to keep the team almost going and uh, the belief in the young blokes. They certainly get belief out of Gary Bean on the ground. He's been a really good young captain. Uh, I say young captain because he's never probably experienced too much in that, in that role. He's just grown in that role. And I can just see him being a incredibly important part of AFL football history, I reckon. Kane Corns is somebody we've celebrated on the program this year. His future uh, was up in the air, to say the least, last year. I've heard you on radio saying that you uh, had a meeting with him and you said you were here to extend his career, not to end it. But uh, have you look, when you look at Port Adelaide's history, he has uh, been one of their great players. Oh, there's no doubt, and he's going to break the all-time games record in our next game. And uh, I think nine out of ten years he's been in the top three and the best and fairest mm. of the football club. Won four BNFs. You know, again, our form was probably a little bit like Kane's has been at the start of this year. One to five, Kane was in absolutely ripping form for us. And, uh, you know, he probably just uh, he slowed up a little, but he's a, been an incredible player. Did you talk to him about why it uh, almost soured beyond recall? Uh, in the past at, at yep. Port. Yeah, no, look, I, I certainly didn't go there too much because I wasn't a part of that. But what I, you know, I said to him is that, uh, you know, there's some certain things that we expect him to be able to do as a player. He is like Don Cassisi, one of the few leaders that we've got as far yeah. as age goes at our football club, and they're important to you. You should, you should, and I learned again at Geelong, you should respect your champions, and uh, I think they're very important to look after them as best you possibly can. And you've got a young bloke, uh, Chad Wingard, who hopefully could come through as a champion. His form uh, as a small forward's been quite superb as well, albeit dropping off in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, I think Chad's uh, had an incredible season for us. He was a high pick in the draft. His first year in the, uh, you know, in the competition, you know, he played some good football. This year he's gone to a whole new level. In fact, I'd say Chad's in our best two or three players yeah. this year. And, uh, you know, he's, he's been a really worthy player for us. And, uh, again, someone who loves the contest, wins his own ball, takes an incredible mark, but then wins his own hard ground ball. Well, Just it was from pretty... a coaching point of view, Kenny, you, you, you're going to GWS in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Probably the darkest day in the in the club's history. Well, how do you handle that? Do you, have you thought about that yet? I mean, obviously it's a week or so away. How do you handle that from a, a new coach taking a group over there, back there? Uh, I think we just talk about um, behaviours, Ruzi. That's what we talk about all the time. Is that if we get our behaviours right, you know, we know that's defensive method and, and then some offensive method. But the defensive stuff, if we get that right, and our behaviours are right. Outcomes, I always say to the players, outcomes are a, a product of your behaviour. It's not, it's not the end of the game. You go, well, did we win this game? Well, why did we win the game? And we usually, well, you'll win the game because you do enough things right over the course of four quarters. Mm. That's exactly what we have to do against GWS. We've got to do enough things right for four quarters. Now, our problem has been doing it for four quarters. I think we've won 23 quarters for the year, which puts us up amongst you know, the top sides on the, on the ladder probably. There's, there's a couple of sides that have won a couple of more quarters than us, but that puts us up amongst us. Unfortunately for us, we've had some bad first quarters. Mm. And again, on, uh, on Saturday night, we had a terrible third quarter. But over the course of the season, 23 quarters is a pretty solid performance, yeah. guys. I think you were heading down the uh, payback uh, route. Yeah, you, I just Ruzi, wonder with the, the young guys, I mean, one, it's interesting. I mean, it's hard to talk about coaches. You're and talking about they, the Port Adelaide's loss. Yeah, the GWS, loss and, yeah. And, and Primus. Whether the players, and I'm sure they do in some way feel guilty about when a coach leaves. I mean, players at the end of the day are ultimately responsible. So I'd be interested to see, you know, whether the players are uneasy going to the week or whether they feel like, you know, let, let's really, you know, we owe this past coach rather than, I mean, it's not your yeah, issue, no, but I, it'd I be fascinating I, to see. What I've got at Port Adelaide is an incredible proud young group mm. you know and I think if you know if I know them very well I know led by Travis that they'll want to stand up and yeah they'll go back and they'll have a little think about what has gone on we've got to be honest enough to say that that that's probably going to be in their minds and and I'll back them in that they're very proud and they'll come out and give a really good account of themselves. Well, it's been great to see uh, the people flock back to the house of Kosh. Uh, let's hope uh, we <laughs> see it many more times later this year. Uh, great to have you on board, Ken, and uh, thanks for coming over. No, thanks for having me. Ken Hinckley, coach of Port Adelaide, our guest tonight. Uh, plenty more to come on the couch after the break.